Good morning, this is Vaughan at Wesco Bell Pottery. Uh, this is October the 4th, and look at these flowers. This is called a Montauk Daisy, uh, and um, we have them everywhere because I bought one bush, or I was given one bush, by a friend of mine called Yvonne Westhaver, who is a student. And she gave us the bush that's at the end. Um, let me see if I can get that a bit bigger for you. No, it doesn't get expanded on video. Anyway, that bush at the end under the orange sign for my neighbor was the initial bush, and we take cuttings about 25 to 30 every year from that. And we have been putting them to create hedges everywhere. So the great thing about that flower is that it actually flowers when everything else is dying. I mean, that's sad in it to say that, but the flowers are all dying off now. We haven't had a freeze yet, but we were down to four degrees centigrade last night. But we have been putting these Montauk daisies everywhere. And they make a really nice hedge. And they go about three, four feet high. You have to trim them back. But look at the height of those. So it makes a nice barrier, like a hedge, a privet hedge. And like a privet hedge, sorry about that car. <laughs> like a privet hedge, you have to trim it about 50% after the third year. Um, but look at that, that's only, uh, is that two years growth? Those are probably in their second or third year, I can't remember. I think it's uh, the third year, but they're huge now. So I will have to trim them at the end of this season. But they just make this beautiful privet hedge. And then you've got the backdrop of the beautiful Riverport little bay there. So that is actually Japanese knotweed, which is an invasive species, but you can't get rid of it. Let me give you a little eyeball of this mountain of daisies. Sorry to take up time. You're waiting for me to show you some pottery, but I had to show you this. There's like a mountain. It's like a, a huge wave of daisies. And here it is from the other angle all the way along. What an amazing wave of daisies. People have been asking me for the two clear glaze recipes that I use. This is the one I use for uh, cone four. And this is the one for earthenware, cone 04. And then and I, to, I use a higher bisque. I do 01 bisque when I use this glaze, and then an 04 clear glaze. Okay, this is that wheel I just reviewed. It's a Vivor wheel. Um, <clears throat> and we hadn't uh, decided whether we could do this, the uh, bat pins on it. Um, so I took one of these standard plastic bat things, drew holes. I actually did a set here and here, and it wasn't quite accurate enough. So be careful you get them in the right place. So I re-drilled here and here. Uh, <clears throat> and I also realized that underneath the wheel, there are some ribs. So this hole, was when I did these, is a bit too close to that rib. So feel underneath the wheel head and make sure you're gonna drill the holes where there are no little ribs because you won't be able to tie, tighten up the butterfly um, wing nut thing uh, if you uh, uh, get too close to those ribs. So just be aware of that. And then I simply took a thin drill, drilled through, drilled through, and then a bigger drill, which is the size of the pin, uh, and drilled through and drilled through. And it was easy. The, the, you know, it's aluminium, it's not a heavy metal to actually drill through. Um, and then I simply took the bat pin. This is a number 20, and it's the shortest one they had, which I think is three quarter inch. <clears throat> and, um, and it worked fine. It doesn't catch, let me show you. It does not catch the splash pan. There you go. And the other question somebody asked is, can you slow this wheel down? So it gradually, so it goes really slow. And I'm doing that right now. Is that sensitive or what? That's great. So you can get really slow. Oh, oh that stopped. Yeah, so that's the slowest it can go pretty much. And that's really slow and all that. So you should be able to do everything you've got to do at that speed anyway. Let me get a little slower. Nope, it stops at that point. So that's it. So one, two, three, so that's, I would guess that's about 30 revolutions a minute and all that. <clears throat> but anyway, 
that's how to do it. You put your back pins on. Um, and then you just, you know, throw as a normal wheel at that point. So, um, the splash pan, somebody was mentioning there's leaked. And that the only reason, I just think this could be remade so that these overlaps could be the other direction. Because if you were throwing in the, the Japanese way, it wouldn't leak. Um, but because we're anti-clockwise, it, it, it drives the water into the actual gap. But like I said, stick a sponge underneath there and it's not even a problem. Just a little round sponge right underneath each side. Just going to catch the drips because it was barely any drips anyway. So just that's an update on the Rebel wheel. Just doing some random stuff catching up at the moment with just getting, I got just got over COVID, feel much better and everything and uh, the hurricane and everything. It's been a lot of tidying, but, uh, but anyway, I'm going to start back in the studio. I just fired my gas kiln and um, so I've got a bunch of things to do, but, um, but Bill Wright just sent me this tool. Um, he makes them, I guess. Uh, and I think it's, there's a name for the company here too. Uh, where is it? www.artisanpotterytools.com. I can post that in the comment section. Um, but he makes a variety of these and I told him just to, you know, when he called me, just take your pick, send me whatever you want. So this is the tool. It's a nice looking tool. Um, and, uh, so I'm going to do some trimming right now and I guess I'm going to try what this can do is uh 50 years old just about and you can see it's very rusty but look at that it was very much longer originally i've sharpened it so many times um and then um i was also sent some free tools recently that i was starting to play around for chattering but this is one that's meant to do that job so let's see get a bowl on here i'm not sure if this is too soft for the job but we'll soon see I've noticed when you're chattering that the softer the clay, um, the deeper the marks, and therefore the glaze will actually uh, pick up on them really nicely. So this is just a giving grit. Uh, this is a tool, this is just a rib. It used to look like this. And now it looks like that because I've actually used it so much. This is just from wear and tear doing feet, feet on my mugs. But you can trim with these too, except this one's so worn out, it'll leave lines. But you just put it on a surface and it will take clay off. So it's like a smoother as well as a trimmer. Clay's a bit dry, uh, soft for this tool. But you know, I've shown those before. But anyway, so, so trimming, you just can use anything. You know, you got, I actually have some strapping comes with the when i think they use plastic mostly now but it was strapping i got from uh part you know, packages that were sent to me that was made of metal and i always saved it until i got so much i knew i'd never use it but um but that you can make tools out of as well do i have one of those around here yep, i do this one is just a piece of that metal strapping that came and that works great too so if you ever get any of that metal strapping, you just have to make a handle and duct tape it to your handle and you've got this needs new duct tape, it's coming loose. But those are great tools. Well, I like to define where the edge of my decoration area will be by putting a little mark in there with the edge of the tool. So this is good for trimming because it's not blunting my tool because the clay when it gets dusty will actually blunt the tool as well as being unhealthy to breathe. So if you got if you can trim out the center a little bit and put some pressure there and just feel in case it's giving. Uh, because you don't want to dig down too far with your trimming tool you go right through. So I've learned to just put a little pressure on in the center and just see whether it gives at all. And then you know you basically can't trim anymore. And this is the stage where I try try this. So well, that's just not going to go too close to there because the foot's in the way. So I'll have to hold that at an angle and see what it does. I think it's making the squeaking noise. Oh, look at that. It's not doing it up there, so what am I doing wrong? Thanks, 
If I'm holding it in, that's getting in the way because if I'd hold it lower, but it's making, it's touching the. Once it starts, I guess. that side anymore. Let's see what the other side does. Because I can get that closer up there. Now it's starting to vibrate. It's actually trimming rather than... Oh wow. These really deep marks. Let's go and try the end of this a little bit now. I've got plenty of clay to play with. It's not vibrating much. Very little. But you know you've got something when you hear that vibration. So the clay needs to be drier. That's what I'm getting from this first attack. My goodness, look at that. Holy mackerel. I have never had a trimming tool that did that. Uh, ch ch chattering tool rather, look at that. It didn't really seem like it was doing a huge amount, but holy mackerel. That I'm gonna have to play with a lot. Can you believe that? Let me get you close in here. See it? I don't know how close an iPad can get, but that is some deep chattering. But that's amazing. There you go, you can see it again up there. I think it's possible my clay's too soft as well. I started signing. Okay, let's see what we have now. Same again. I'm going to use the flat side first. Just finding the pressure point. The tool vibrates really well. see what we got from doing just that. Yep, that's your regular chattering mark. It's very subtle. Um, I think you can see that. I've got a light overhead, so hopefully you can see. Um, but the uh, that was using that side of it. Let's see what happens when I do this side of it. squeaky noises, the right mark, but it seems like it's more trimming. Yeah, so this clay may just be a little bit soft, I'm not sure, but when I did it before, let's go down this way again. You got the vibration, so that's when you start moving it. that one it's like a pebbly kind of marking going all the way around so um, I think you can see it let's get you in there oh, I don't get you too close can you see it there you go <clears throat> and then of course when I do, was doing it with this part let's see if I can get something here <laughs> Yeah, that one, you're making like a groove. And then you stop before you go, <gasps> woo, holy mackerel again. So this tool is spectacular with the end there. 
And I think because the clay, you've got a wider area there, it's a little bit more subtle when you use that section. Um, but, um, but this is to play with, um, cause you've got to, you know, try it in different hardnesses of clay too. And after I've done something like this, I will then go in, like I said, with my details and make some defining edges. Cause I've always liked it when it has like a edge to something, when you've got a, dis a decorative area. So you see, get that line in there. And I could even do that right here and see whether that helps that design. Yeah, you don't see that that much there. But I like to go back up here and get rid of any marks on my foot. <coughs> and uh, get the junk out of my foot area there. I'll blow that out when it's stopped. And then I've also used the giffing grip just as a way of measuring, but and put three lines down there. And it's a way of breaking up the glaze field area. And because we've got that, we can actually measure the halfway point. And just put three lines in. And this is from a tradition I, I noticed in slip trailing from Thomas Toft in the Middle Ages and via another potter more recently called uh, John Pollock's who used to define the slip lines, the little areas. Uh, and of course you could actually, you've got those lines going down, you could go again, halfway again. So you can tell it's not very dry because it's easily getting them off out, but it sticks to the tool a little bit. but that way your tool lasts longer too. So now we've got these defined areas, then I could actually go in at an angle, and this is where you get those patterns from slip trailing. Missing each time you miss one. direction and this is where you've got to get your arm swinging in even diagonals so once I start one I don't move my arm again until I finished all the way around because I can keep the pattern right and you can do this on the inside as well So you've got a, a herringbone pattern all the way around. Can you see that now? Just see that in the lights turn it a little bit. All right, so we've got lots of texture on this piece. And uh, it's a good idea before it gets dusty to blow this out. Oops. Just get these off of you. There's a little something stuck in the clay there. And actually, whenever you've got a, a heavy texture, if you just use a slightly stiff brush, but not one that will leave a mark itself, go over your texture, it will knock away any burrs. You could use a sponge, but that will often soften it too much. And then, knowing you've got a good strong foot, you can lift it up and take a look at it. That's a lot of texture on that piece. All right, I'm not going to do anything to the inside. Textures on the inside, if you're going to use food with sauces and stuff in a piece of pottery, can actually, you know, trap food. So I don't like to texture the inside very much. Okay, it's uh, four and a half hours later from the uh, initial trimming. So let's give another one of these big balls brush with a chattering tool. Let's see. We got three choices by the look of it, that way, that way, or that way. So let's see what we can do this time. I wonder if I should go really fast. Well, the slower you go, the deeper the hole. 
It's still trimming. Feel a little bit of a. That's when you can tell when it's doing it. And so it's smoothed out towards the top. Yep, we got a nice chattering movement there. Are you seeing it in the picture? So that's when it was doing it. So it liked it when it's harder. This is soft still, I think. That's why it's not doing it there. But let's do the soft area with this part. some pretty serious looking chattering holy mackerel pretty amazing eh so then finishing up I like to identify the edges so I'm gonna do that and there's another pebble I can hear it hitting and then the foot area foot area is not too bad I don't need to do much there Just do a little trimming. And then, like I said, after you've chattered, I would just take a sort of, not a totally stiff brush, but just one that's not gonna leave marks in the clay, but just brush away any burr that might be there, because you don't want it to be sharp. You can use a wet sponge, but that might take away a little bit too much of the edge. Well, when I normally carve and I flute down those areas, it takes a while to do that, but this is very quick as well. Let's get you a bit closer. Look at that. Serious chattering. So, I think this is a nice tool. And there's a whole bunch of them, and I just got one to play with. But um, I'd say these are nice tools. So, it might be worth having those in your ammunition in your studio all right all right so and let's have another go with this it won't lose its sharpness when the clay is this soft as well so let's try a little bit gentle Increasing the pressure doesn't do anything. Leave it. Speed it up. Now it's starting to vibrate. Now I'm going to bring it down. was all with the side oh wow yeah it was a different mark we, we got it vibrating really good that time I'm gonna take this little area off though because I was over the edge of where I was trying to keep the definition in and we mark that up there so this is a very even When you first get a tool, and this was literally brand new for me when I took it out of the bag in this video, it's just a matter of playing with it. it has a really natural, rocky look to it. This works better than any of the handmade trimming, chattering tools that I've used, that I made a lot myself over the years. 
but I think this one, Bill's done a good job of making it. But let's let you look close up. I think it's, that's where you look at it over there. That's a pretty serious chattering effect there. Okay, if the last thing I'm gonna do as a test here, uh, everything's been great up to now, is I'm gonna try chattering on the inside of a bowl. We'll see if this works, if it does. Um, I'm not sure I can do this much because like I said, texture on the inside of a bowl can trap food. So you gotta be a little careful when you do things like that. But anyway, this is a collar, which I threw a cylinder. It's got no, foot, no bottom in it. Basically just see-through. Um, so you can rest things in it when you're trimming like so. <clears throat> so let's see if it's centered at least a little bit. Depends on how if the collar is centered. It's going to be hard to hold it because of the angle I think. Um, do that way and try this way. Actually you're not going to be able to see very well. Let's move you over a little bit. Okay so what were we doing this way? Try it this way edge first. So let's see what we have. The upper part of the bowl where the food isn't, I think was okay to do that. As long as it's not too deep, so the glaze will, but that you've got to use a fairly thin glaze when you do chattering too, because it can actually hide the chattering. See if I can finish with a little bit right at the bottom there. Okay, can you see it? Let's, let's see if we can get the light better. That's the inside of the bowl. It works really good. I've never done the inside of a bowl before. That's brand new for me too. This is a, a sort of noodle bowl I've made and I've been using that trimming tool, uh, Bill Wright's tool to do some extra um, sort of decoration on the bottom of the piece um, rather than using it everywhere it's just a small but look how nice that is right. here's a little job I'm doing today um, since it's just a catch-up sort of day of a bunch of odd things for me really um, this is one of those stencil balls that I do and um, so I've actually airbrushed the um, sage color green I call it and up to my light blue and then I'm just kind of brushing in randomly here some underglaze which is uh, fundament Mako fundamentals they call it so I'm just kind of moving the brush around I kind of don't like this brush I think I'll try a different brush this is one of my favorite brushes for painting areas because it's it's kind of got worn in the center so it's shorter but it means you can kind of do a thin line or a wider line. So I'm just kind of moving it around. Let's see if I can get it to go in an area where you can see it. It's a bit harder to do it over here. So I'm just moving the brush like that.
And then the stenciling part comes in handy because then you can see what happens. Here. Let's see if I can get this a bit easier to look at. I've got to try and figure out I can do it so you can see. So there's a tree there. And that video I just mentioned shows how we put these down. So just look back in the history and you'll find that video. I did a row of apple tree, like an orchard in the background behind all the rest of the stencils. Now you can cut these stencils either with an X-Acto knife, a scroll saw, or you can buy yourself one of those newfangled things that I keep getting told to buy and I, I'm just stuck in my ways. I like cutting the stencils. I use a scroll saw or an X-Acto blade. It seems to be you know, I don't make a huge number of these type of pieces because they're so time consuming. So I don't need to cut masses of stencils. Oops, I pulled the roof up too. Better keep that in there because I need that there for a minute. Okay, the next thing I have to do, maybe this is too thick, I've got some yellow underglaze here, uh, sorry, yellow slip, and uh, I have to remember where all the windows are. Oh, it's perfect. Lift it up. That's the roof. Very carefully so it doesn't actually drop back down. Oh, that one did have some, so I'll have to hand paint those, those windows in. It's just time. If you miss one, you're going to take it a little bit longer doing something that could be done faster. to know exactly where you got something. 
take a picture with your phone, I guess. That's where I thought there was one, but I'm pretty sure there isn't one there. I didn't get the roof lined up properly on that one, so I've got a bit of painting in there. And that's where I say, if you make a mistake, you're not actually, you can always go in and paint something in afterwards. Like that line just there, there was a, that stencil was a little bit off. <coughs> but then it just took a bit of extra time. <coughs> The rest of the roofs are pretty good. So this window in the roof, I'm just gonna water the yellow down a little bit. I don't want to, there's a little bit of yellow missing just there. I don't want to make this yellow too watery. If you've got a steady hand, You can just paint in by hand. If you're trying to make a living doing pottery that's decorative like this, <coughs> it's really hard because um, time is uh, your enemy. Because if every minute you spend on something, you're supposed to charge a little bit more. Okay, so I now have in that area that I painted down the bottom, some sheep. And I think I even put some cows in these. And this is where you've got to be very careful not to pull hard because you don't want to tear the paper and let it fall back down. So you've got to know where they are. And try to get the end one so you can just pull gently until it releases and then you can just help it out. So I'm looking for the end. This is a long stencil here. I think I'm gonna have to pull from this side. I was trying to do it the other way so you could see what I'm doing. Maybe I can do it this way then. Because it will tear easily. That little piece of paper I'm pulling on, in fact, I'm gonna use two hands at this point. This is a long one. It's a shortish one here. So get your finger above the blade underneath and your finger on top. Just gentle, gentle. Because you don't want the paper to tear right where your finger is. So we've got some little privet hedgerows. And then right inside the bowl. I painted some black and then put paper sheep over the top. But I will be painting those sheep in white. So I, I'm just at this time of the year, after the season's over, I'm just trying to catch up on things that maybe I, somebody wasn't in a rush for and they wanted to order something. So I put them on the back burner. Um, but when I've got time, I have to get caught up, of course. And Christmas is coming, so gotta think about what I need to make for that. Did I do things in threes? Often I make things in threes. <clears throat> but I don't think I did this time. Because there's a big sheep down there. Actually, I think the Sheep and Wolf Festival, I designed this piece for the Folk Art Museum in Manhattan uh, decades ago. But there's a Sheep and Wolf Festival on in New York this weekend. Maybe it's next weekend. Always know because I set up and it snowed one year while we were out outdoors at a show. There you go, so you got four and four. But I'm gonna check, because did I do five? I should have written it down. If you're ever 
in um, a dilab, I think I did four or four. But if you're ever looking and you just can't tell, then you have to poke because you can't leave the paper in. The paper will burn out in the kiln, but it leaves a layer of clay over the top of it, which will be then flake and give you rough edges too. So you can't leave any paper in. So you'd have to take your blade, which is really sharp exacto blade, and just poke in at an angle and feel. See, I've made him poke there, and all I have to do is tap it down and it's sealed again. So that's how to find them if you can't find one. I did four and four here. There's no way I did five because these were big ones and I could see a big one easily if I had one in there. But... And then I can go in with a roundish brush over the top. So I'm going to try this brush again. The stencils kind of break the color brush marks a little bit. And that's good enough for that. So then we have to do the same again. I've got a layer of bushes over the top of some sheep.
Here are the two bowls that I was painting and stencil removing earlier on. Two different styles. And there's the outside, it's painted. Put some green apples in the trees. I was gonna do red, but I thought that might be a little bit too bright. And that's a big teapot I'm gonna be carving later on.